Let's give a hand for the music. I am Mrs. Whiting, and as long as you're already clapping, let's clap three more times. Uh, let's give a big thank you to the boosters. We could not do this without them. Put your hands together. Nice. Let's give a shout out to the tech crew for the light and the sound. Give them a big hand. And we could not do this without all of you. We have the best student body, and you, you make this happen year after year by being such good audience members. Give a big clap for yourselves. All right, today you are going to see Sierra DeMulder. Sierra is a poet and a podcast host. Her poems include deeply powerful imagery, and I'm sure you're going to love them. Um, this has garnered her international recognition. She is a two-time National Poetry Slam champion and a five-time published author. Sierra is also the co-host of a very popular podcast, Just Break Up is the title, which offers relationship advice to listeners. You can check it out on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Uh, it's been downloaded over four million times, which is pretty amazing. And her next novel is coming out very soon. Please put your hands together for Sierra DeMulder. Hello, friend. How are you doing this afternoon? Excellent. Um, so how many people here, it's their first Writer's Week? OK, how many people, second Writer's Week? Are there any seniors here? Or like, yeah, OK, third Writer's Week? Fourth Writer's Week? OK, cool. This is, I think this is like my eighth Writer's Week. Um, I took, uh, thank you. I took um, a couple years off from writing and publishing to make a podcast and to have a baby. So I'm back now, and I have a new book coming out in June of this year that I'm going to read from mostly um, right now. So yeah, OK, here we go. How many people here believe in, I'm going to start it out a little weird. How many people here believe in reincarnation? Cool, cool, couple, people, yeah. How many people are like, what is reincarnation? Excellent, cool, cool. So reincarnation is like uh, the idea, it's present in lots of um, spiritualities and religions um, about past lives, that you get reincarnated from one person to the next, or maybe you get reincarnated into a cow or a bug or something like that. Uh, and I don't actually know what I believe. I don't know if I believe in that, um, but I'm a very interested person. I like um, different spirituality and spiritual ideas, and I like like the metaphor of it, the idea that you could try again, or you could get a second chance, or that maybe you could like do it right in this lifetime so the next person wouldn't have to like struggle so much. And this is a poem about that. The woman told me over voice memos how she cleared my sacral chakra of the trauma of a past life. The womb carries, she said, and we are all heavy with outdated fashions of ourselves. I don't know what I believe. My mother has a reoccurring dream. She is trapped in a dark and human space, dank with the smell of death, urine, one small window cracked too high to reach. She believes this is a memory from her life, but not the one she's living. Once, a woman in Britain wrote 70 pages of hieroglyphics in her sleep, detailing her past life as a priestess, and I don't write in a diary because I am afraid of myself. The womb carries, and I wonder what collections it has by now, carbon footprints, baby teeth, spools of fear in every color, broken dishes and white lilies, all that we are curated in some illogical museum, all that we are sifted through and passed on in a haze of tracing paper, the ghost of an ink smudge. So says the two-year-old with the uncanny knowledge of World War II aircrafts who has nightmares of planes crashing into the Pacific. If I am a remake and this life, the after image of an after image of a soul, new as a first word, tell her I am attempting to free 
us poorly but stubbornly. I'm attempting to let go. If not for us, then for the next passenger. Tell her I'm afraid, but I'm trying anyway because what more can we ask of ourselves now and then but to race over and over imperfectly against time, disease, famine, heartbreak, freak acts of humanity and nature only to wake up back at the starting line, salvaged and full of hope. Thanks. So um, like my introduction said, I am a five-time published author. I want to talk really, really briefly before I dive into more poems about my career. I didn't plan on being a writer. I didn't plan on being a poet. I just found something that I loved and sort of chased it like Wile E. Coyote off that cliff, and I didn't really look down. And I was really lucky that the world opened up opportunities. You know, I started writing poetry and doing spoken word events and competing at poetry slams back when I was 20, 21, before YouTube was a thing. And so I was really lucky that the rise of the internet and sharing media like that um, coincided with my career as my career got older. And poetry has taken me around the world. I have performed in, I've gone on tour in Australia and Germany and Austria and Budapest and Mexico and England and, I, and 44 of the 50 states and from high school eight times. Um, and I feel really grateful that I've gotten the opportunity to have a non-traditional career in creative writing. Um, and I'm also really grateful that that career led me to my podcast, um, Just Break Up. You can find it on all listening platforms. Um, and we have a weekly listenership of about 10,000 people. Um, so that's me. Um, I did get my undergrad degree in um, English, but only when I was 27. I dropped out of college when I was younger twice um, be, to pursue poetry opportunities that didn't pay and didn't have a potential to them. Um, because again, I was like chasing that thing that I felt really drawn to. Um, I went back and got my undergrad in uh, English when I was 27 in hopes of potentially teaching one day. Haven't ended up doing that um, in a traditional setting yet, but. Anyway, so my fifth book, I'm going to read mostly from it. I know there were a couple of requests for some poems you might have seen in your English classes. Unfortunately, I have a nine, ten-month-old baby now, um, and so I don't sleep a lot, so my memory is not quite as good. So I'm going to read mostly from this new book coming out in June. It's the one all the way on the end, Ephemera. Um, so one of the themes in this book is it talks a lot about life and death and time passing because you, you know, you, turn 36 now, and you have a baby, and you start thinking about time differently. Um, and one of the themes in the first section of the book is about my grandmother. I had the privilege to have, uh, to take care of my grandmother while she was dying on, uh, while she was on hospice care. Hospice care is when you have a terminal illness, and there's no medication or treatment that will change the trajectory of that disease, so they just try to make you as comfortable as possible. Um, and I took care of her with my aunt and my mother during that time, and it was just one of those experiences that, like, you're not the same afterwards. Um, so this is the first poem in the book. While my grandmother waits for death in the other room, her lips cracked as brown sugar, her fingers moving in sleep against the buttons of her nightgown, the women of my family play cards. They forget to eat cry about past lovers, sort bills and outdated subscriptions. They sit on the floor, taking turns massaging out the grief and answering worried calls from friends, clergy, neighbors who sloppily soak the phone in their regret. I should have called earlier, but the holidays, you know. There is a camaraderie among women and death. Both know how to become a vigil, to be both busy and still, an usher from one room to the next. One sister drove through the night. One daughter wore the same clothes for a week. I was wrong. My grandmother isn't waiting for death. Instead, drifting in and out of a much softer word, it is the living who wait, who count the hours, the morphine doses, the last request for ice chips. It is the living who wait with their card games and their tears and their own hushed regrets from all the time they had nothing to wait for. Okay, so I am a part of the LGBTQIA community, and thank you. Uh, thank you. 
That is not the response I got in my high school. <laughs> it was not cool to be queer back then, uh, but that's okay. Um, so yeah, I spent a lot of time in my, because I um, identify as bisexual or whatever that means, um, I spent a lot of time in my 20s writing love poems for people, but being really ambiguous about the pronouns, right? Being like, oh, you are such a babe and I want to kiss you. Not really specifying if it was for a lady or for a gentleman or for someone who does not subscribe to those things. Um, and Funny, not funny, funny story. Uh, the first crush I ever had on a girl, so I had a high school sweetheart. His name was Jacob. He was a good guy. We didn't work out because we were young. And then we decided to be friends afterwards, like you do with your exes, which is, by the way, a terrible idea. Listen to my podcast, Just Break Up. Don't be friends with your exes. And so I ended up telling Jake, I was like, I think I have a crush on this girl, Caitlin. And he was like, Okay, cool, cool. And two weeks later, he started dating her. <laughs> Whoever's applauding that. <laughs> yeah, I know, that was a sketchy move, right? <laughs> uh, so this is a poem about that. How to change the pronouns in your love poems. You are 18 and drunk for the first time in a bed of a pickup truck next to the girl you call your best friend but whose mouth you loves to watch move. You are cloudy from swigs of cheap vodka passed around a hormonal fire in the middle of a field because that's where parties happen in upstate nowhere. You spent the night dancing with her, giggling like arias and squatting to piss together on the outskirts of light until the world started to twist so the two of you crawled into the, truck of a bed, the bed of a truck somewhere in the haze of liquor and wood smoke, you find her hand and fall asleep watching the stars blur, wondering if she will remember, remember any of this in the morning. Days later, when she starts dating your ex, the first boy who ever loved you, you will glimpse them holding hands on Main Street, fully awake in the daylight where everyone can see and you will feel a shipwreck wash ashore inside you. You will tell everyone you're jealous. You will lie and say of her. Thanks. So I did something nerdy um, and made a little PowerPoint. Um, this next poem, um, I crowdsourced half of it from my Instagram. It's called a found poem where you get to take pieces of poem from an article or a newspaper clipping or an email and you can incorporate the words in those things for uh, and make it into a poem. So what I did was I put an ask box in my Instagram stories and set, asked my Instagram followers what made them deny, like what made them deny themselves love? Why didn't they love themselves? And it was actually a very fascinating human experiment because the answers were incredibly diverse. You know, it was anywhere from like, I have debt to my relationship with my father to I have big feet or I hate my face, you know? And it was fascinating because of the diversity of the answers and also the, um, you know, the triviality of some of these things, hearing it from other people, hearing why they, did not, why they didn't like themselves for things that they couldn't control or often didn't deserve or didn't ask for. It was a very humbling human experience and putting them all together in a poem, um, I hope gives people some perspective um, on that. So I put it on the PowerPoint because, or the slides because uh, it says, I asked, the title is, I asked why you have denied yourself love and the answers are crowdsourced from the author's Instagram, the italics, denote direct quotes. Absent parents and the man who made me mistrust every man after. I haven't earned it yet. 
What is love if not a salary, the sweet treat we get for being demure? It feels too selfish, too vulgar, unladylike to gorge myself on the moist cake of it. I've got bad credit, a prettier sibling, a rank history of mistakes, each one more foul than the last. The timing was all wrong. The timing was all right, but I was afraid of losing it. I'm disorganized, my brain is broken, and it was stuck on something I thought was love. I've spit it out before just to prove that I can. I believe I am ugly, and in the end, it's just easier this way. Familiar as a callus, tongued over like a cracked tooth, suffering feels cleaner. Because if I start to believe I actually deserve love, I'd have to find unacceptable all those incapable of giving it. Thanks. So I was one of those people that got married over the pandemic. Um, we were supposed to have like, you know, like a modest wedding of 70 people or something. But instead it was like 10 people and we didn't touch each other. Uh, it was a strange time, summer of 2020. Um, uh, but the, my wife uh, is, we actually dated um, when we were younger. I was 20 and she was 24 and we worked together at a coffee shop. and. We only dated for like nine months. Um, I was a hot mess and wanted to kiss everything. And so she dumped me appropriately. And then I just sort of thought about her for 12 years. You know, I, I moved on with my life and so did she, but then we reconnected out of the blue and um, ended up getting married. So this is a poem about the beginning. It's called Now and Again, Now, comma, Again, in the f uh, for W in the first months of our second relationship. Today, while you were at work, I sat at your kitchen table and imagined feeding you dinner. It's a game I play, paint a portrait of a family with no water or brushes, just strokes of the eye and mind. I am still shocked I get to love you again. Your face, the locket I wore until the patina left a green smudge between my breasts. I measure, our t I measure our time apart, not in days, but in two precedents, a birth, a birth, a lanyard of funerals, bodies swallowed by dirt or rolled like bread into the incinerator. The day you dislocated your collarbone in Boston, I paid a stranger to, in Minneapolis to drag ink-soaked needles across my body. The day you closed on your house, I latticed my first pie crust 1,200 miles away. We almost forgot each other. I fall asleep on your chest now, again. It's familiar drum, a mother's singing heard for the first time outside the womb. I love how your body shows me I was gone. The shy crackle of crow's feet, the new scar, the garland of grays haloing your forehead, crocuses sprung from a winter without me. This next poem is actually uh, from my, from this book. Oops, it's not there anymore. From Today Means Amen. I printed it out for you to read. Um, I, so I'll take a break from the old book for a second. This poem's from my sister. Uh, my sister and I grew up in upstate New York in a tiny rural farming town. There were uh, 50 people in my graduating class, and I was raised by hippies. My middle name is Fawn, if that gives you an essence of my childhood. And I tried to include some imagery from upstate New York and our childhood in this poem. This poem is in support of my sister who had an eating disorder for over 14 years. And uh, so if that's um, content that is difficult for you to listen to, please take care of yourself. Blackberry Briar, Hunter's Daughter, Ocean-Eyed Mermaid. When my sister needs to talk, I extend my arms towards her like a child asking to be held. I turn my palms upward as if donating blood and let her empty the contents of her day on me. Her words file out orderly at first and then a swarm spilling over me like the soft swell of a mushroom cloud until I do not remember where I begin and her need ends. 
Once I held a newborn baby in my arms, three weeks old, she felt so small. Her heart beat a moth I trapped between my palms. This is how to love the healing. If my sister's eating disorder were a person, it would be a teenager by now. I imagine it, doorknobs for knees, long, graceful fingers like the legs of ballerinas, the beaks of cranes. It would have a favorite book, a locker combination, a best friend, her. I won't let her live in her, my house. I tell her I won't let her live in my house if she lets it sleep over. I tell her I can't see it, but I know it's there. I tell her nothing and just let the cloud of her day rise like dough, milkweed woman, catacomb breast. This is how to love the healing, to be not the sound, but the receptacle, to be not the therapist, but the stop after, to be not the paint, not the blank canvas, not even the sweat of creativity, but to be the bed the artist crawls back to. Tonight, I rub my sister's shoulders. My thumbs mistake her back for the staircase in our childhood home. She tells me that she is scared, that the waves are rising and the ship is begging to become drift with the hounds are howling tonight and the moon is so full it could burst. She tells me that she has been symptom free for three weeks. Three weeks, it feels so small a newborn, a heartbeat, a fluttering of smothered wings. But sister, this is what it's like to heal, to get up again and again after the waves come, to retrain the hounds of your body, dragonfly, child of stone and moss. You are dancing this dance you know by heart. You are crawling out from under yourself, spring drinker, sap collector. You are drawing a map to forgiveness. Where you live, where you already are, you just don't know it yet. Perfect isn't where we're from and we wouldn't like it there anyway. Big sister, little dipper, who taught me how to sing the way light streams through a window, how to live boldly and without shame, sister. When we were little, I didn't know what it was like to face the dark, twisting woods behind our house alone. When I think of what courage is, I see your hand reaching back for me, leading me into the forest, into the unknown, the seam of your shoulder, the horizon of your voice saying, look, I've got you. I'm here, Blackberry Briar, gardener's daughter. You were born to walk through this. You were made to travel that long journey into yourself. Now look into the distance. I'm there if you need me, arms out, ready to listen, ready to Thing, sweet sister, I've got you. I'm here. Thanks. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so back to my grandmother for a second. Um, something that was like very precious to me during that time was. Uh, my grandmother would ask us to read to her and we would take night shifts because she would need things in the middle of the night and um, you know she wasn't eating, she uh, couldn't keep water down. And so uh, one of my favorite memories that this poem is about is reading Mary Oliver poems to my grandmother at like three in the morning and her falling asleep to me reading. And now Mary Oliver is a modern poet, very popular, and she ended up actually passing away just a few days before my grandmother did. Um, and this poem is, this experience happened just a couple days before my grandmother passed. Hours before dawn, I read Mary Oliver poems to my grandmother, my feet propped on the childlike railing of her hospice bed, my thighs turned pincushions until my voice is hoarse, not nearly as dry as the graying woman beside me being taken slowly, not by cancer, though it has been cruel, but by the steady hardening of dehydration. I read about black bears sticky with honey and roses, their expanding faces unfurrowed by such living frivolities like fear or importance. I must tell you, every poem is about death when you are reading to the dying. Even common words shrug off their working clothes to reveal their true evening desires. Occasionally, my grandmother will raise a spotted hand and ask me to repeat a line as though it were a sunrise or candy she wished to savor just a bit longer. Mary Oliver wrote, once wrote three poems about her dying friend, but they were really more about what particles on earth were shifted or repurposed when that soul was called home. Do we just stop like the hard click of a cassette player, or do we close our eyes for only a moment to open to new scenery, new but familiar form, like a mama fox or one of her kits or a snowdrift yawning over a field? Her eyes are closing now, so I soften my voice to water. 
Her breath slows, deepens, a stream becoming a river. My final words, barely a whisper. Without opening her eyes, my grandmother says, you're drifting away, or maybe I am. I think it's both of us, I say, and then her sleep is real. Uh, okay, really quickly. Um, so, yeah, no, I'll just do those. <clears throat> Here's a love poem. Um, when, uh, nope, just kidding, changing my mind. Okay, I'm going to read two poems back to back. Um, so when my wife and I... Um, were trying to get pregnant. We were having a hard time getting pregnant, not just because that's not how things work, you know what I mean? Um, two ladies together to make a baby. Um, but I ended up getting pregnant, and my first pregnancy resulted in what's called an ectopic pregnancy. It's when the embryo implants in your fallopian tube instead of your uterus. And it is incredibly dangerous for not only the carrier, but it is uh, no, no ectopic pregnancy can, be, can survive. So basically, I had to have emergency surgery. They removed a liter of, my, liter of blood from my abdomen after my um, fallopian tube had burst. And then they removed the organ as well as that pregnancy. So it was a very traumatic experience and definitely shaped the way that I wrote this book and moved through life. Um, so I'm going to read two poems about that um, back to back, and then I will be, and then I'll read something a little happier. As she tapped a needle into the ridge of my ear, the acupuncturist told me how surgery can trap cold in the body. The warmest, most quiet parts of ourselves made loud under the fluorescence of an operating room. I don't feel cold as much as I feel opened as though I lost not just an organ, but a bet with some faceless collector. I am a purse turned inside out. I am a mural tagged overnight, something made more and less of itself. I don't feel like I lost a baby, I tell anyone who isn't scared of my grief, just the dream of one, as if that is somehow easier to bury. Unheld, unnamed, just the foolish hope of you, and the audacity of my joy spilling everywhere like that. We're having a baby, she says. And you swore you would never be like them. The women on the blogs and the message boards who talk about skipping their own sister's shower or canceling on friends who only know how to talk about their kids or the one woman who confessed to screaming at the drugstore cashier who was handing out roses on Mother's Day. No, I'll never be like that, you thought, until you found yourself sitting across the table from a beaming couple and you cough your congratulations, flimsy as gauze, and you mean it. Of course you mean it, but you never thought you'd be that woman, jealous as a toddler made stingy by grief tell the readers it was you at the drugstore who saw the bucket of roses individually wrapped like syringes a hundred tiny dancers blushing proud at their first recital and it's not true is it you didn't scream after all and that too is a part of your story the silence of it being offered something blooming and saying no not me not yet Okay, I'm gonna just do two more. <clears throat> so we did get pregnant. I have a 10 month old baby at home waiting for me. Um, and that was great. And when I was pregnant, I was like waiting to tell people, um, my wife and I were like nervous. You know, bad things happen to you and it makes you nervous to celebrate good things. And uh, we were like, it makes you think a lot about time and life and impermanence. You know, if high school sucks for you, it's going to be over in a heartbeat. My 10 month old baby is going to be 10 years old in a heartbeat. Time starts moving so fast when you, when you get a little older um, and you get that perspective. And so this poem is about some things that I was thinking about uh, while I was pregnant. It's called New Vows. 
When my best friend got married, he walked down the aisle to a song about death. Isn't that what marriage is all about, he laughed, a promise to be together until one of you dies? I regret my wedding vows, too focused on the benign, our boundless laughter, how I cherish just waking up with you. I should have said, I take thee and all the treachery aliveness guarantees. I should have said, I will help bury your elders. I take your hand and your heart murmur, the cancerous growth above your father's ear. I take your family history of alcoholism and give you back a possible covenant of dementia, miscarriage, high blood pressure, in sickness and in car accidents, shared, excuse me, in sickness and in the mundane, shared calendars and anniversaries spent arguing about our budget. You told me once that Great Danes have a short life expectancy, only six to 10 years if you're lucky, and I cried, who would sign up to love something so impermanent? Oh, beloved, we have been so happy lately, it's making us nervous. And isn't that what marriage is all about? A love so darling, so hallowed and exposed. We both volunteer to be its keeper when the joy runs dry, when the body fails, not because but in glorious spite of the unpalatable, impossible fact that someday one of us will wake up first only to find ourselves alone. All right, one more poem. This is not in the new book. It's just an old spoken word poem that I want to end this set with. And then I'll take some questions. If you have any questions about my work or what it's like to be a professional author or how cute my baby is because she's very cute. <laughs> um, okay. How many people here are just having a really bad year? Thank you. Yeah, just a couple people. Yeah, yeah, cool, 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 cool. Cool, 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 cool. Uh, I wrote this poem several years ago uh, <clears throat> and have had several bad years since then, so I think it still applies. Let me get a sip of water. Uh, this poem is called, don't poke my eye out with that piece of paper. This poem is called Self Care. <clears throat> if you were to ask the world, which is to say the internet, what self care looks like, it would tell you candles. Hundreds of candles stationed around your bathtub like a winking flower crown flickering in the corner of your perfectly angled Instagram photo captioned hashtag me time. It would tell you it's sipping tea, not coffee, in a color coordinated mug at dawn or doing yoga outside at dawn or writing gratitude lists outside at dawn or even knowing what the heck dawn looks like. It would tell you it's drinking your weight in water. It's buying a new set of nice sheets. It's a gym membership. It costs money. It doesn't spill or stain or fray. It would tell you nothing about how hard you have to cry to break a blood vessel or what it's like to order takeout again, a whole pizza you can't afford to eat alone in your bed like a slow eclipse, the box in your bed, your body always in bed, it's not a grave but somehow still a burial. What it's like to choose between paying for your cell phone bill or the water bill, knowing you drown yourself in both, endlessly scrolling, soaking up a thousand lives before you even get up in the morning. Or what it's like to be so lonely you dream in sitcom characters, fantasize about the thought of your ex, the one who treated you so poorly you might as well let him screw you over one last time. Do a quick Google search to see how trendy healing looks these days. Thousands of shareable images of well-curated mantras pasted over a postcard of the rock Rocky Mountains, I am enough. The truth is, I look nothing like this. The truth is, sometimes self-care is wanting to text the person who hurt you, but instead letting your phone die. Sometimes it's showering without sitting down in the tub. Sometimes it's falling asleep in the afternoon and waking to a lake of blackness, speaking to no one for days. Sometimes it's making it to the job uh, you hate on time because you have to, because you've got bills to pay and your boss doesn't care if you need to hashtag center yourself. These days, self-care seems to come with a price tag and a filter. Healing is rarely so photogenic, nor is it one size fits all. And I know as a poet, I'll have to pay some sort of poetic severance tax for how cliche that line is, but I'm sick of prioritizing what's pretty over what is true, which is to say, it's been a hard year which is to say, I hid myself from you because I was afraid the mess would disgust you. This spring, I let the lawn grow long. I let the sun forget me. 
I ate that whole damn pizza myself. I went for walks, cried the whole time, took a picture of nothing. I found the box cutter again, renamed it an organ, a cancer, starved the desire to die from my body, let the laundry stay swallowed in the hamper, watched dust paint the coffee table, ignored the dishes in the sink, and I need you to know there was mold. None of it was pretty. No one healing is a baby's first word. No one really taught them what to say. They just picked up what they could, made it up as they went along. And whatever we do, however we get to the next day, that is just as valid as the glittery veneer we've been taught to hide under. I did buy candles, though, from Target. The ones picked over and half off that smell like pine and cinnamon and a chemically engineered ocean. And isn't that self-care? giving yourself permission to believe in seasons. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Um, so I'll take any questions right now if you have any. Um, my newest book, I don't have any uh, merch or books with me right now, unfortunately, but my newest book is available for pre-order if you scan that QR code or you go to my... Instagram, you can find it in that uh, my bio or whatever. Does anybody have any questions for me before you start packing up? Because it is too early to pack up. Yes. What is my most famous book? What is my most popular book? I think the one coming out next, getting bigger and bigger. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Can we see my baby? Is that what you're asking me? You can go to my Instagram and see her on my Instagram. Yes. That's a great question. Do I know what the end of the poem will be when I'm writing the poem in the beginning? Um, I would probably say no most of the time. I think maybe 20% of the time I'll write the first line and think, oh, that's going to be the end. I often think about my poems in terms of what is the overall feeling that I want to, or, or thesis statement that I want to get across, and then I just sort of let the poem unfold like a scroll, and then often edit it, in it like move things around like Frankenstein it, and see how it really feels. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. What does what mean? Mercy? What a wonderful question. Um, I think probably just being gentle with yourself and others. Listen, we're all here, hypothetically, only once. We don't know what we're doing. We don't have a manual on how to be in relationships with one another. We don't have a manual on how to uh, maintain happiness or a long life. We are just figuring it out as we can. So mercy to me would probably just be giving yourself and other grace because we're all just making it up as we can. Yes, Orange Hat. Ephemera, excellent question. Um, the ephemera means um, something that exists or is enjoyed for only a limited amount of time. Like it's commonly heard as like an ephemeral flower that only blooms for like a week or ephemeral season. Yes. Am I still close to my sister? Yes, I have two sisters actually, and we are still very close. Um, I, I love them very much. Any other questions? Yes. You can get a photo to post on the Instagram? Yes. I will. What? Probably not. Sorry. <laughs> That's just being honest. That's called a boundary, everyone. Listen to Just Break Up. Anybody over here? I think I, yes, in the back. I can't hear the question, friends. What is the favorite poem that I wrote? It's a poem called The Fawn in my newest book called Ephemera. You can see a video of it on my Instagram. Yes, in the way back. You know, somebody asked me that earlier. Um, I have a lot of poems about death because it's inevitable. <laughs> uh, I think the meaning of life is probably just kindness. I don't know. Anybody else? Help me out. Who is right here? Yes. What draws me to write about uh, relationships? I think because um, I am a Gemini. <laughs> you all hate me now. Um, but no, I, uh, 
because I think that human connection is the foundation of life, if I have to answer the other question before. Um, so I often find myself figuring out the intricacies of human relationships through writing. That's what draws me to it. And plus, like, there's a commonality to it, y'all. Hey, Orange Hat, I answered your question. You're standing up while I'm talking. Thanks. Um, so I think that poems, oh, everybody is freaking out now because I have eyeballs. OK. so. I think the cool thing about poems is that we get to see our stories mirrored in other people. That's why we like lyrics. That's why we like stories. Hey, Orange Hat, please sit down for me. <laughs> oh, yeah, bye, 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 bye. Sorry, Teach. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> that doesn't hurt my feelings or anything. Um, hey, yes, go ahead. No, I don't really follow people because of their follows. Sorry. I don't, I don't follow people because of their follows. Cool. Anybody want to ask a question about poetry? Cool. One more over here, yes. What type of question, wait, what type of poetry, what? Um, there's a poem called, there's a, there's a form of poetry called a contrapuntal. It's actually inspired by music, where you have two po columns, like two poems, one here and one here, and you read the first poem here, and you read the first poem here, and then you read both of the poems across, and it's supposed to still make sense. It's called a contrapuntal. Jamal May has the best one ever called I Do Have a Seam. You could look it up right now. That is, I've never been able to write that form of poetry because it is insanely difficult. Yes. The first poem I wrote about, I wrote a, a, I wrote a um, what did they call it, a limerick in fourth grade that said, um, there once was a, wa uh, what was it? Oh, there once was a son from Australia who liked, oh, there once was a mole from Australia who liked very much to go sail ya, but his ship one day, it just blew away, and that's why my poem is a failure. Ayo. <laughs> okay. Uh, is there a question over there? Yes, somewhere over here. Um, uh, the one of the most popular modern poets right now is named Ada Limon. She has wonderful, phenomenal classic poetry that's relatable and also very profound at the same time. Because that's one more thing is I think that we we think that poetry or song lyrics or or whatever like cool writing has to be not Relatable. It has to be obscure. Um, and Ada Limon is very relatable and, and writes in like plain language. Yes? How did I start publishing books? That's a great story. I started out, this is going to date me, but I started out putting out my poems on Tumblr and uh, like posted them there. Um, I also submitted to poetry submission contests and performing on national stages and started like accruing an audience, you know? But I didn't publish my first book until I submitted to a independent press for a book competition and I won. But um, uh, the more important thing for me is just like that I put my work out there because four books later, I got approached by a major press because of the poems I had, because one of the editors had seen me, my blog, you know? so. Sort of like when I think about your your reading order, uh, your reading audience, um, you can't blame people for not coming to a party they weren't invited to. So you have to put your work out. Hey, thank you so much. Have a great day.